Hey there, my name's Mark McCartney and welcome to the What Is A Good Life podcast. Over the last two years, I've interviewed over 150 people around this question, not to provide you with the universal answer, but to help you find and define your own answer to this question. While I'm also trying to share with you what I perceive to be more genuine expressions of the human experience. On the 20th episode of the What Is A Good Life podcast, I'm joined by PJ Milani, who is a content creator at Milani Creative and the media arts director and teacher at Episcopal High School. I follow PJ's daily content where he shares visual metaphors that simplify complex ideas. So I was intrigued to hear what his thoughts were on this question and the role that creativity plays within that. In this episode, we discuss the significance of creativity in terms of fulfillment, flow, connection, empathy, and self-expression. PJ also outlines how a daily creative practice enables us to handle ambiguity and develops greater problem-solving capacities. While he also takes us through his journey and motivation for all his work, inspiring more people to a life of creativity that leads to a more connected and creative world. If you don't presently have a regular creative practice in your life, this episode will give you a lot to consider. While for those of you that do, it will give you more inspiration to maintain and deepen that practice. I took a lot from this episode in terms of different perspectives on creativity that I hadn't previously considered and I'm sure you will too and if you enjoy this episode please like share and subscribe as I'd greatly appreciate your support at this stage of my podcasting journey so without further ado the 20th episode of the what is a good life podcast well PJ thank you very very much for joining me here on the what is a good life podcast today as I as I mentioned to you in the intro or in our in our pre-chat there I'm a big fan of the work that you're putting out there I think you're really distilling some some really kind of complex wisdom in very simple uh, and engaging ways. So I, I was very, very uh, looking forward to this conversation today. Thanks so much for having me, Mark. I'm, I'm excited to get into it. Wonderful. So the first question, as I typically ask PJ, is the question of, is there a question that you're trying to answer as you move through life? You know, uh, it's interesting in our, in our pre-chat, you had mentioned some things and literally those that's kind of the key question that I've been grappling with in the last probably six months to maybe a year. Uh, and that key question is how do I navigate this tension between trying to achieve more or doing more and being enough? And there is like this inherent tension. So, you know, when you're trying to push yourself with ambition, trying to get to a higher place, uh, and if, you know, you consider this kind of like a, a visual, uh, let's say you're at the bottom of the mountain and there's a little gem at the very top. You see that gem and you think, okay, if all I got to do is just get to that gem. And then you finally get to the gem and then you look over and there's another mountain with another gem. Because it's like, oh, okay, I got here. But you don't just embrace that moment, really. Because uh, essentially, it's that whole arrival fallacy where you think once you get somewhere, that's going to be enough. Uh, and there's this like mindset that you kind of get into where you just kind of, uh, I guess, the, the road that you pave in your mind that becomes the easy road to continue to continuously walk through is becomes the way you continuously think so like if you get yourself in the habit of thinking i need to get to this place it's really hard to break out of that habit once you get to that place um so i and, and you know you said you're you're going to be a father soon which is really exciting uh this really kind of um hits home for me because a year, about a year ago is when I started, you know, posting work online. And the whole reason I started posting online, and you had mentioned, you know, you journal, uh, so you might appreciate this too. And I have like a lot of journals here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I was writing in my journal. Uh, so I just turned 41 and I was writing in my journal and I was saying something to the effect of, you know, I really should start, you know, doing something creative again online. You know, I, so I teach film and animation. I've been teaching that for at, at least at that time it was 18 years. Now it's 19 years. And my students always ask me, hey, what are you working on, Mr. Milani? Like, what are you, what's, are, are you making a movie right now? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I am at my capacity teaching. 
Like that is where my capacity was. And, but in the back of my mind, I was always thinking like, I, I need to reconnect to the creative process because that's only going to make me a better teacher. And there's so many things that you can lose touch with over time as you separate yourself from the doing and all you do is the teaching. So you have to have a balance of both. And because that element was missing in my life, I felt this kind of like void uh, for, for a long period of time. And so I was writing in my journal and I was remarking and talking about this. And this was like close to my birthday. And I realized, I was like, this is a little bit of a deja vu. So I looked, uh, I like picked up another <laughs> one of my journals and like, I swear to you, like, I found an entry from 10 years ago, again, close to my birthday, that said the exact same thing. And it was like 10 years ago. So in my 30s, I said it, and I, in my 40s, I said it. And I thought to myself, holy crap, I either start doing something about this, or I just accept the fact that this is not going to be for me. And so I took the step of just like, you know what, I'm just going to dive into it. And the reason I just dived into it is because I get it. I've always been in this analysis paralysis kind of state where it's like, if I don't know why I'm doing something or what it is ultimately going to be for or what it will turn into, then I hesitate from taking those first steps and I'm slow to move. <laughs> so right. I, I just thought, you know what, instead of trying to figure all those things out, let me just get into some kind of movement and figure it out as I go. And so I go to my wife and I, and uh, you know, we're in the kitchen and I'm like, you know what? I think I'm gonna start a blog. And she goes, do people still read blogs? <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> and, and you know, a month later, apparently not. Uh, Cause I, after doing it for about a month, yeah, uh, it was like writing into the void. And I didn't expect to, and I, to be fair, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't really tell my friends. Um, and the reason for that is I didn't want them to like feel compelled to read it. Uh, I was, I wanted to see if anyone would be interested in anything I had to say on its own. Um, and at, at this point also, I should say, I avoided social media like the plague. Like I just didn't want to be involved in social media. Uh, but I came across um, Cole and Dicky on um, Twitter, and they uh, actually I didn't find them on Twitter. I found them on YouTube, uh, and they were talking about you know you should post your work on Twitter and uh, these platforms, and that's the way you can start to share your ideas, and that is a way to essentially distribute your work, and you navigate this like tension as a creator between. And Lawrence Yeo, who is uh, a tremendous creator, uh, he's the author of a blog called More to That, very similar along the lines of Tim Urban, if you're familiar with uh, waitbutwhy.com. But Lawrence has this really beautiful way of uh, articulating the tension between internal validation or internal motivation and external validation. And you have to have a little bit of both in order to continue and kind of keep going essentially. And that's what I was missing. And so I started posting on Twitter. I started with writing. And the, re the reason I started with writing is because I feel like everything starts from writing. Everything starts from being able to clarify and articulate your thoughts through writing and distilling them down. And also, you know, you need to kind of know what you, it is you want to say. That turned into visuals because I started seeing some visuals online. I was like, I do this with teaching. I, in my classroom, I essentially am always using metaphors and stories to try to communicate something foreign to my students to make it feel more familiar. And some of the stuff that I use, I always say to my students, I turn into visuals. Uh, and so that started to pick up some traction. And so it took off from there. And, and the reason, I started all of this is for some kind of creative fulfillment. And as I started doing all this, though, I also started to take notice of am I by because our time is 
finite, right? And we have to embrace uh, one of my favorite authors, uh, Oliver Berkman, who wrote a book, uh, 4,000 Weeks, um, I would, which I would highly recommend reading. Uh, and I feel You're like the second I had, person to recommend that book to me in the last week, oddly oh, enough, it's <laughs> right. fantastic. I feel like if I had read that book before I started writing online, I might have done something different. And the reason I right. say that, and I don't regret it, but it's it's this concept of finitude and how we feel so compelled to constantly do more, uh, which again co- goes back to this question that you initially asked, which was, you know, what is that question that you're grappling with, and Essentially, because I had such a limited amount of time with, you know, children and my wife, I want to be a good husband. I still want to be a good teacher. Um, and I want to be a good father while at the same time being a creator. That's a lot. Right. And so there, I found myself at times navigating in the evening, especially because that's the only time I have. Uh, or the mo- early morning to, uh, to be able to do any kind of creative work. That in the evenings, there would be times when my son would ask to play. And, um, you know, at first I would say, oh, hold on, buddy, I got to do this thing, um, maybe tomorrow. And then after a couple days of doing that, I was like, what am I doing? Am I, am right. I sacrificing? the limited time I have with my, with my kids in order to pursue something that's going to be something else. Uh, and at the time, again, I didn't know what it was, what what it would be. And so that's when this question really started to kind of hit home in my head is like, I have, I am because I'm in my forties specifically, and I have responsibilities. I don't have, at least I don't feel that I have the luxury to put my head down in that hustle culture way and grind it out because I'm not just sacrificing um, my time. I'm sacrificing time with my children and I'm sacrificing their time with me. And also if I'm trying to teach through visuals, who is the most important person (laughs) to teach these kinds of big lessons? My children. And, and my, and of course, you know, I, I still want, to engage my students. And so I have the stuff to outside of school that I need to do in order to make sure I put my best foot forward as a teacher. So this is a tension that I've been navigating, which is appreciating where I am and being present in that space while at the same time moving towards something that is generally, um, I suppose, you could call it achieving more. Um, I loved, and I, w- I wish I could remember where I heard this from, but there is a time where you're building your vessel in your life, and that's usually in your earlier 20s and 30s. And it's not to say you stop at any point, but there's also a time you need to be able to take that vessel out to sea and actually appreciate and enjoy all that work that you put in to building right. this thing. Um, and sometimes I, f- I feel like, or at least at this, throughout this like practice, I felt, wait, am I just trying to re- make my vessel just bigger and better? And at some point realize I never took it out to sea. And uh, that part of it, I think, is really what kind of um, kind of haunts me. You know, I lost a really good friend um, earlier uh, well, uh, late last year, uh, to cancer and sorry to hear man. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it, it, it hit him like over the very pretty aggressively in two years. Um, and that was was really tough. And, and the crazy thing is, and this is what haunts me even more is I missed a window of time. And unfortunately, COVID really made a big impact. I missed a window of time to be able to see him. Um, and he had said he was gonna, he was in remission. And the next thing I know, he had passed away. Like it was, the, I had a message from him that said, he was all excited about remission. The next thing I know, I get an email from his email that uh, from his 
one of his friends who said that um, he had passed away. And that just, I, I literally just stood over my laptop and just started crying. I just couldn't imagine, I just couldn't, I couldn't process it. Uh, but that, again, really hit home this idea of at what point in your life do you start becoming present in appreciating where you are? And it is not a dichotomy necessarily. It's just that, at least for me, I know for me, <laughs> I have a hard time being able to do both at the same time. So that is yeah. the question that I've been essentially grappling with. Where where are you in, in just even in trying to understand the uh, the dynamics of being enough and and uh, but also trying to achieve more, like having ambition? And I, I love this idea you have too of you know when you said at the start you didn't typically like to start things sometimes if you didn't know where the outcome was. So some of this was also stepping into the void. Um, but I love the idea of our life's work almost creating this bigger and bigger vessel or this, you know, we're refining this vessel. And then I love the idea then for whatever age we're all at, like to, to finally put that out to see and, and to see how it goes. So there's this, there's so many interesting things in the, in the, in the sense of, you know, what is, what is enough and, and also respecting or my desire to expand further when when does this when does that balance not feel right for you yeah you know i think it's really gripping when when i feel like i put a whole weekend or and i'm and i'm going to get pretty granular because uh it's easy to talk in these like big macro level things but i think on a day to day it's really the day to day that we all kind of struggle in yet we don't really spend too much time thinking through the day-to-day -day of how we spend our time and where we're putting it towards because any if we're always thinking in the long term at least for me when i think in the long term i can find myself neglecting to make the best choices for today you know because right. i think it I essentially throw away decisions because I'm like, there's always tomorrow. And so uh, getting granular about it kind of helps me kind of get a footing. So when I spend like a whole Saturday or a whole Sunday writing or doing visuals, um, I really try to make it a point now that that's when I feel out of balance. If I do that, that's when I started to notice this imbalance because I'm like, and my kids will find things to do and my wife will find things to do. And this is kind of some a conversation we had moving early on where I was like, if I do this, you know, what, what will this look like um, for us as a family? And so this is not something like I'm just kind of sequestered in my room and <laughs> this was all kind of like by design to some degree, but right. I'm also like conscious or I've grown conscious over time that that time could also be used to bring our family closer together or spend time with friends. And, and unfortunately, once you get to a certain age, if you don't, have the foresight to plan something in advance. Spontaneity kind of decays as you get older because everyone has their own pockets of experience that they're crafting for themselves. And everyone also moves at different rates in terms of where they are in their lives and what milestones they are hitting, uh, or if they even want to hit certain milestones, like. Some friends want to get married, some friends don't, some friends want to have kids, some friends don't. And so some people want to have a house, some people move away, you know, all these things, right? And uh, I found that if I don't intentionally craft what's going to happen to stay connected with these friends and, and also create these experiences for my kids, 
then it just doesn't happen. And it, it will turn into a default life. It will go into an autopilot mode and everyone um, is probably guilty of, to some degree, falling into these. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. I just found for myself, I suffer internally uh, whenever that's happening. And that autopilot, I'm, I become conscious of that autopilot going in a direction I don't really want it to go towards. And so, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but but yeah, I think that's when I start to take notice of it. And then I start to try to hopefully make a move towards away from it. When you say um, just a, a kind of a, a default existence, uh, could you just uh, elaborate on, on what that means to you? Uh, well, it, the def a default existence is one that doesn't take a breath to experience what is happening. Um, as you kind of noted, one of your practices is trying to experience mindfulness, uh, whether it's med through meditation or it's through journaling. I think that is to me, the lack of that, the lack of, of, of um, marking what, what is happening to some degree is a default experience. And again, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. And I kind of envy people who are happy and present um, if that exists. Sometimes it's easy to like sit, think or imagine that other people don't suffer in that same way, uh, or at least may not suffer as much as maybe I personally do. I'm, I've uh, one of my good friends um, likes to call me the seeker in the friends group because I just am constantly in this like searching mode. And I think that again is so also something that I'm conscious of that it is not necessarily reality. It is just me personally who is really kind of maybe more, I'm sure everyone experiences to some degree, but I find myself more, uh, struggling through this like lack of being present and lack of being able to mark that like when i don't do that i find myself suffering a little bit more than maybe the average person yeah we're we all we all have our own unique wirings don't we because i i resonate with what you're saying there like if i if i feel like i'm not if i'm not a uh, if I'm not touching base with myself or just trying to even check the landscape every so often, I, I can find that to not to not have that regular check in. It, it seems it, life gets a little bit uh, unchecked would be hardly the, the most, uh, you know, the, the greatest way to describe it. But there's something about it where I feel like I'm, I'm not paying attention anymore or, or some, something along those lines. In terms of when you said before you started this project, just the the building sense within you. I, I really like this idea of almost like a building sense within you that you needed to do something. Uh, generally, what's your relationship been like with creativity? Like I know all the work you do, even uh, as a as a teacher and a, a programs director and things like this. But like, what's the significance for you, or could you describe that feeling of? potentially having some sort of creativity within you and it going unexpressed and, and what that feels like for you? Yeah, you know, I, I, I was just talking to my students about this maybe about a month and a half ago. And I'm not really sure if I can pinpoint why I find this so valuable. And I think it's anecdotally because I I found myself most at peace in a state of flow. And so that flow is usually if I'm trying to create something, whether that's in a movie, whether that's through a lesson or that's through a visual. So I was just talking to my students about this and I was telling them because, you know, 
I'm teaching an art class and an art class is an elective essentially. And I'm talking to my advanced film group and some of them, you know, are going to be making a very difficult decision to, instead of taking art classes or, or an art class, they're going to double up academically in order to be able to get into college, or at least this is the strategy that they're, they're choosing. And so in that conversation, I, I encourage them if, even if they don't take film or whatever they do, that having a daily creative practice is one of the most important and crucial things, in my opinion, to live a significant life, at least to feel a fulfilled and meaningful life, in my opinion. And again, creativity can take on so many different forms. I think there are some traditional ways of looking at it, and there are probably more practical ways. Like, you can be just as creative as a teacher coming up with creative lessons. You can be just as creative as a, uh, as a software engineer who's coming up with exactly that's problem solving, essentially, coming up with solutions. Even my students who I've who've gone on to work in environmental stuff and uh, lawyers and uh, business folks, you know, we'll have dinner uh, and we'll be talking about how it's going. And, and I swear to you, every single one of them, separate from one another, has in their own way communicated that the most fulfilling part of what they do and what continues to make it feel like a calling to them is solving problems and being able to find creative solutions to those problems. And right. essentially that is what I'm talking about. That feeling of working through something in your head. And I call this the zone of ambiguity. Like essentially before you step into the creative arena, if you will, you have an idea. And so you're kind of in the dark at that stage. The idea is a little tiny little light bulb. And you imagine like this giant cloud in front of you and you have to step through this giant cloud and fog. And it's, you don't know how long it's, you're gonna be in that fog. It, that's the zone of yeah. ambiguity. The, the thing that I think would happen- You're, descri you're describing my life very well at this point, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> But I, I think, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that that space, though, as a creative, what you start to understand is that it's not that creative people don't experience that zone of ambiguity. It's just that they are built, have built the confidence because they know that it's just a temporary state and you will eventually get through to the other side. And every time you start anything new, that's another creative idea or another creative problem, rather, you will have to reset and go back on the other side and go through another cloud of ambiguity. But you build the confidence that you know you're going to eventually get through to the other side. And so I think that confidence is something that one is very empowering, but two gives us like this sense of fulfillment. And again, that's, that's why I, I kind of profess to my students that I think it's such an important part of their lives because again, it gets them into this flow state, it gets them into this zone and they're, they're going to feel like they're contributing something into the world. And yeah, so I think that that essentially is. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but um, that essentially is one of the most important things for me is in that practice, you're able to kind of finesse that muscle and get it stronger, but it doesn't get necessarily easier. You just, with each, pra with each, with each rep, maybe that gap between zone of ambiguity and maybe zone of insight gets a little bit smaller or it gets bigger depending on the problem that you're trying to solve. But you just, again, you still know that you're going to be able to get through it eventually. You know, there's, I've never, uh, I've never actually thought of, uh, 
art and creativity and that sense of going on a quest each time you embark upon something. But that's almost what it sounds like, right? Yeah, like absolutely. there's there's this lovely idea of it's almost like trying to find your way through like almost this jungle of, you know, thoughts and ambiguity and uncertainty and you're you go in with the maybe a wider idea and then you're like almost like a a sculptor you're just paring away at it with each iteration with each thought with each way or each different perspective you're looking at it and and i i think when you said there like one of the one of the most helpful things in my life um was reading the artist's way um Mm. a, a number of years back and that's what brought me into journaling and that was almost just the repeated process of going into the, the going into my mind, going into the uh, like the uncertainty in my mind, like really trying to see it for what it was and, and remove and go through some of the the fog with within it, if you know what I mean. And I don't know, I, I think that's such an underappreciated element of, of art, of just the the resilience of going into that ambiguity and coming away with a a clearer, more succinct idea than than when you went into it, and how widely practical that is across so many fields. But just not even just because I usually thought of art as in terms of like maybe an expression of emotion, a good way mm. of processing things as well. But just from an actual point of view of like improving thinking, mm-hmm. it, it seems to be such a, an important part as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's, I found when I was younger, it's such an interesting point that you're essentially, when you're, I I never considered actually, you make, you bring up a really interesting point that when you are journaling, you are also essentially going into that fog. And this is essentially building this connection to yourself in that in that fog and every time you kind of get through you feel like a little bit clearer in who you are so yeah i think that's a lovely way to kind of frame it it just with with what you mentioned there in terms of uh using using some of these tools to get more clarity on yourself. I know, I know the question that you initially said that you're asking as you're moving life, the, the balance or that tension between achieving more and, and, and being enough. How much of, even with the, the work you're doing at the moment, how much of, of that is, you know, you getting even like, are you sharing your process with some of these posts or, or where do you even get the inspiration for them? And, and is, is all this a, is this kind of a, a byproduct of, of kind of work on yourself or self-reflection or, or how would you describe it? Yeah, I think, I think it's that, I think it's even, I think it's more, a little bit more than that too. Um, so at this point, like if I go back to the analogy of the mountain where you're kind of at the bottom and the gem is at the top and then you get at the top and then there's another gem, you're kind of like, oh, I guess this is going to be a continuous climb. Uh, yeah. There are times when you can just sit down with that diamond and look at the sunset and appreciate the view. So that's the being enough part. But I think when I started thinking about this even more, I started thinking that what I'm doing online right now is essentially what I'm striving or trying to strive to do rather is instead of thinking of it as a destination a place to finally get to and um i came across this uh after school youtube video if uh and I, which i who I absolutely love um and it was uh it was a piece from alan watts it's like four minutes long and right. it's it's uh, life is not a journey and I remember seeing that for the first time and I was like, oh, it caught my eye and I I clicked on it. And essentially, it's like when you view life as a journey, if you use the context of that metaphor, then you also fall into the trap of thinking that there is a final destination that you're trying to get to it, even at all. And Alan Watts equates this to that there is really no 
reason for life. It's not that there's no meaning for life, but it's, it's, it's playful. The meaning of life is playful. And the, he uses the analogy of music instead of a journey, because the point of a journey is to get to the end. But the point of a composition is not to get to the end. <laughs> like you don't listen to music to yeah. get to the end. So the whole point of a dance is to enjoy the dance. And that just so resonated with me. And so as I had been thinking about this question, I started to try to apply that context to this metaphor of mountains. And essentially imagine that you're at the bottom of the mountain. And if you've ever driven in the mountains, you know, like you see off into the horizon, the mountains in the distance, and you're able to enjoy the view while moving towards something. And so I imagine this giant diamond <laughs> behind the mountains that I don't ever imagine reaching. And that to me symbolizes purpose because like a purpose is really just this thing you aspire to. It's not necessarily a, an achievement to, to make. And so that is essentially what kind of framed or is framing rather what I'm doing online, which is at its best at my, if I'm like, if I deep dig deep into my secret wishes, I want to do what I do in my classroom, which is essentially spreading the same message that I was spreading with my students about a month ago in that conversation where I was encouraging them to live a more creative life. Because if we all live a more creative life, and this may sound really cheesy and idealistic, you make the world a more creative place. And if, and again, that's not something I ever imagined being able to reach. And I don't have the, I don't have the ego to think <laughs> that I, I could probably do that. But if all of us to some degree, and this is why I was so uh, moved by your approach is that there is power in, in everyone doing their part. And, you know, sometimes we think and we hesitate to do big things because we think we're so small. But if all of us in our own small way did our small things, then we would have a big impact. And this is not revolutionary thinking, but this is essentially where I started to kind of land on was as I started to think about these things, which is build towards this or move towards this purpose, I can be moving towards that direction, instead of thinking about, I have to get to that place. And if in some small way, I can get other people to walk with me in that direction, then that will feel fulfilling without feeling like I am also at the same time, I have to get somewhere. And so, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of where I've kind of like, as I've been wrestling with that question, like thinking about what it is I'm trying to do online and um, what it is I'm trying to do with my work. It's, if you, one of the things I try to do specifically in my images, I, I've, I know that some of them are just utterly romantic and you know, people will respond, well, that's not the way it is. And I'm like, okay, not for you. <laughs> but, but even if it's not the way it is, is that the way if is what it is, it, the way it should be. And if you don't agree, then move on, keep scrolling. But if you do, then why not? Why not believe in something? Because you know what, I rather believe in something that is romantic and be wrong than be cynical and think the world sucks and be right, you know? So that's just the way I rather move towards throughout my life, you know? When you think of this idea of uh, the world being a little bit more creative and 
in whatever way that's brought into being, what are what are some of the things that you'd start to what what would be almost like the because I'm just intrigued by this idea like what would when you kind of have that idea in your head what would be some of the hallmarks of a society that's a little bit more influenced by a creative touch well you know I feel like I feel like a lot of us and myself included I remember in high school seeing the lines in the box where we were all kind of um when I was going through when I was in high school now as a teacher in high school, but I remember seeing some of the lines that, you know, how do I define, how do I explain this? You know, uh, in, in first grade, I remember one of the very first projects I ever, or one of the first assignments I was ever given was to color this thing. And I saw, I was starting to color and I was coloring really like cleanly in the lines. And then I looked over to my right and I remember this kid who was just going like this with his, <laughs> with his like uh, crayon just going all over. And I was like, how, what is he doing? And, yeah. and I, was, I started looking at my own drawing and thinking, why do I feel like I have to do this within the lines? And I know this is like one of the most like typical metaphors but i remember in that moment thinking why am i coloring in the lines it's that so to answer your question to go back to your question i think that it doesn't necessarily equal you know a, a more creative life doesn't always necessarily mean uh something that you can see Meaning, yeah, it's not like everyone's going to be wearing, um, you know, crazy outfits and, uh, you know, there's going to be art everywhere, um, though that would be lovely. But really, I think it's this freedom to be able to look and see where the lines that we've been coloring in uh, have have been and to see that you don't have to color in the lines it can be your choice and i think a lot of the suffering that we see oftentimes is and, and i've seen a lot of suffering especially by posting online um when when someone hates on an illustration and they go to the extent of like <laughs> spending spending it <a>, <laughs> and you would think the work that i do is not necessarily provocative to the point where someone would feel so compelled to write like a lot in to argue against it but yeah. when i see that i see the suffering in somebody else's life where that really sparked something in them that they feel like instead of creating a counter voice of their own again instead of creating their own piece to counter this idea to critique the existence of this one idea, like they are offended by its existence. And that part of it, I think is um, unfortunate because I think if, if somebody has their own ideas, I would love to see counter, counter images or create your own work, but I, I would love, so I guess I'm, I'm meandering a bit, but I think another kind of element to this is I would love to see less criticism and more additional creative work because yeah. the, one of my favorite uh, things I play for my students is the speech in Ratatouille, <laughs> this animation of uh, Ratatouille, if you've ever seen it. Um, and it's this great movie. Yeah. And it's a speech that uh, Antoine, the critic, the, the, the chef, critic, yeah, yeah, the chef. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the... when he comes at the very end, he comes at the very end to taste the food. And he, he just he has this very stoic face. And as he's eating, you know, he doesn't really make doesn't really emote too much. 
But he says one of the most beautiful things, which is it's so easy for critics to critique the creator. But I would love to see more creators out there because again, by putting that work, by, by, I just feel like it would increase empathy in the world if you're able to all participate in the creative process, because as you are creating, you are thinking deeply about things, whether that's a visual or whether that's a movie or whether that's a podcast or anything, you are thinking about how somebody else might perceive the thing that you're putting out into the world, whether it's right. again, this is like, even if you're making an app or you're, uh, you're creating a lesson, all of these are gifts essentially that you're putting out into the world for somebody else to experience. And as you do that, I feel like it can tap into empathy. And again, I don't know if, any of this answers your question and it's very meandering. Uh, it's not a very clear answer, but I think those are, those are kind of like the things I would think. No, no, about. but, but, but I, but I think even this, this idea is really lovely. The idea of, um, you, you know, you back in grade one painting within the lines and then realizing with your marauding friend next to you <laughs> that, wait, why, why am I even doing that? Like, and I don't know, I, I think this is where, this is where I think it, it is a bit unfortunate, you know, even when you mentioned how some of your uh, students might be dropping art and they'll be they'll be doing two other two other subjects to to, to focus on, uh, because I, I think we've got to a point sometimes where we're focusing on what the economic output of something could be to mm. such an extent that we are stamping out our own creativity. Like I, I personally went into to finance and until I started journaling, I hadn't picked up a pen, and this was at around the age of 31, and um, I hadn't picked up a pen uh, just to write anything or to express anything. I hadn't done any of that since probably art school mm. in, you know, in, uh, uh, sorry, art class in high school, which I dropped at a, at a certain point. And I don't know, I don't know, I think there's, there's something so in, in, there's so much there's kind of seems to be so many important life lessons that you're learning in embarking upon a creative process. Um, and then also this idea, as you say, of just the deeper thought that goes into it. And then the, the empathy when you're trying to think of how other people will in, engage with this or um, interact or even just trying to, to inspire other people with something. It's, I don't know th if more of us even had to go through the the vulnerability of having to do that, you know, as well of then actually mm -hmm. making your work public. I don't know. I think it would be it would offer a, a good counterpoint to some of the hate that you just see in terms of what people, you know, the, online at this point is just it's it's unbelievable. I like you. I I avoided online stuff like the plague for. I didn't have any Facebook or Twitter. Well, I don't have Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, but I have LinkedIn now and I use YouTube for these as well. But I, I had no, like I had no um, exposure to just the, the way that people talk on, on online. And, and I don't know, there's something, it seems like the, when people are just critiquing something without any skin in the game, it, it's almost like people's, almost like the the darkest parts of people are coming out mm -hmm. on what something could be seen as almost quite neutral. So like the world just becomes a canvas in which they kind of excrete some of their own discontent, if you get me, like, yeah. which is, I, I, I don't know, I, I think in, in, in engaging with more creativity, I, I do believe would be like, cause there's something very therapeutic to the whole process as well. Mm -hmm. Like, so it, it's a mixture of so many things. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't, and I want to be sure to point out, and I'm sure you, you would agree that it's not to be dismissive of feedback. It's no, 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 no. Yeah. It's, it's more just when you, there are, there is a fine line between, Hey, this thing, is also this, have you considered this versus you suck or this sucks or, you know, you're wrong. And like these, uh, 
contrarian points of view just to be contrarian rather than to have an additional or, or additive nature to them. Um, yeah, I, I, I think there's, there's, a, <laughs> yeah, I think there's just something that we can, as you said, like very, it can be very therapeutic, right? As you engage in this process and it's so, it's so easy to get into this, uh, what will this turn into? Again, going back to like why I started all this. It's like, what will this yeah. turn into? Why am I doing this? And there, I guess I fall back to this idea that, you know, you, if you've ever played basketball with friends or, or, or football, soccer, or any kind or tennis, you don't necessarily do it to become a pro. <laughs> you know, yeah. you don't, it's not, there are very few people who actually are able to play pro in those, in those uh, activities. And I think very much creativity needs to be thought in that same way. Like it's just good for the soul. Like you play a game of pick up basketball because it's fun and you engage in creativity because it's, it's just like, it's just, it, you know, it, it, it just, is good for the soul. You know, um, it makes me think of something a, a few years, well, not more than a few years ago now, maybe uh, five or six years ago, I I, I had never painted um, for a long, long time. And I decided to paint my whole face and body in blue. Mm. Um, and I covered my hands in black paint and I lay down on this large canvas, like I'm, I'm over six foot. So just to, to take my upper body and it was all covered in blue. And it, it wasn't uh, for the sake of pr creating this work of art that I, I thought that, well, to me, it was very beautiful, to be honest, like, you know, yeah. just in terms of because of what it represented to me, but it wasn't that it would be objectively beautiful or it would resonate so deeply with other people. Um, but there was, it captured something. At this point, I was writing uh, very regularly. I'd become very comfortable in expressing things of an emotional nature. It wasn't that I, I didn't have any outlet for, for something. But for whatever reason, I'd got this idea in my head to try to capture something. And it's not like the, we. I did this uh, when I was living in Vancouver. So the painting hasn't traveled with me, sadly. Um, <laughs> thrown in a dumpster, unfortunately. <laughs> But, but still, just the act of literally doing that and producing that, it led to some sort of like peace within mm. myself once I had done it. I, and I can't quite quite explain that. And, mm. and this idea that you've just touched on there, I think, is, is so important because I think even in our hobbies, we've become perfectionists. Like we try to get personal bests when we're running, even if you're just running as an amateur you know, we if we're doing a certain, uh, you know, if it's a mixed martial arts, you want to get to a certain level, and um, all these metrics we have for trying to perfect even our hobbies. So we're putting pressure on ourselves and work. And then I never wanted to take an art class after I did that. It, it, it like, do you know what I mean? Like, I still doodle and I, it, but it, it just became a another tool in which I could play with occasionally. And I may you know, it, it, maybe over through the years, maybe once every 18 months, I'll, I'll play around with it. But I, I think that's kind of what you're suggesting there. It's not this thing where you suddenly all, we all have to go to art school, we have to try to perfect something. It's just available to us once we engage with it. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I think, you know, when you talk about what does it mean to live a good life? I think it goes back to this idea of, um, you know, you're, essentially when you decided to do this this uh painting you had the thought you were like i wonder and then you took the next step and that next step is i think what it means to live a creative life because most people have ideas in fact sometimes you might even hear it talking with your friends and they'll talk about maybe a movie or or they'll or uh anything, something that they've seen. It's like, I thought of that. Yeah. You know, or, you know what? I always thought this, this, this should do this. Or maybe they're talking about the ending of a movie and they're like, they should have done this. And I even had a friend who was talking about, you know, writing a script for uh, like a screenplay. And it was because they saw this terrible movie and <laughs> they were like, I could do a better job than that. And that was kind of what inspired them. 
but they left it there. Right. And I think that second step, that transition to what if, and then actually taking the steps. And it's this experimental nature, like creativity is just synonymous with experimental. Like scientists are sometimes considered, it's funny, like sometimes there's a dichotomy between people use this dichotomy of science of or the art of. And I think you have yeah. to have both. In fact, the science is the precursor to the art. Like the science of creativity and then the art of creativity. Like you need both of those. And I think that the two are so interlinked because you have to be experimental in nature and be willing for it to not turn into what you had imagined. In fact, nine times out of 10, it won't be what you imagine, but it'll be its own thing. Like even in filmmaking, one of the things I tell my students when they're making their movies, and this is not mine, I'm sure I've heard it somewhere, but every time you make a movie, you're essentially making three different movies. You have the movie that you write, you have the movie that you shoot, and then you look at what you have, then you have the movie that you're actually going to put out. So, right. and it changes each time because as you're writing, you don't know what's going to happen when you collaborate on the, on the shooting side. And on the shooting side, you don't know what's going to happen and when all those things are interlinked together. So you have this beautifully evolving thing and essentially that's what creativity is like even when even with my visuals like i gave myself early on the same mindset that i have with my film making lessons and filmmaking practice which is no visual is in itself a static thing it will have future iterations and that's totally like part of it for me anyway and i think that building that into this whole thing of like what it is to have a creative life it's that it's just a moving target and you're okay with that and being able to again transition from that what if to actually bringing something into fruition and then again kind of seeing where that goes from there but it's it's interesting you almost answer your first question then with that idea of like a creative life as being okay with having almost like a perpetually moving target yeah to to kind of be to be okay within that process yeah and you know just i i don't um i don't always just ask guests for for tips in terms of like just kind of processes in which to approach life but if, if like a lot of the people that will be listening will be probably in and around our age and mm. um, I'm not too sure what everyone's creative process will be but how would you kind of encourage or suggest that people could potentially step back into uh, like like what would be the, the 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 initial steps back into maybe a, a more creative life on the back of what we've been discussing here you know, I always, and this is part of uh, what I do in the classroom, is I give all my students a blank journal. And it may sound trite, but it is, you know, the things that are trite are, are, are there for, are trite for a reason. Um, that the easiest lift in a creative practice is removing the cobwebs in your mind. And, and that takes, that takes time. It doesn't happen immediately. And the only way to do that is to be able to pour what's in your head down into some crystallized form. It can be through sketching. So you can use that journal through sketching or it can be through writing. I, don't uh, dis differentiate between the two. They're both part of what's going on in your head. So I used to have a sketchbook separate from a journal, and now I just do both at the same space. And I think there's this fear of, of drawing and sketching 
um, because you're like, if I'm not, a, I'm not an artist. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look like I, the way I want it to. Um, but you know what? It's probably true with writing too. It's just that you're much more conscious of a circle that is not a perfect circle than you are that a let that your word is not the perfect word that describes what you're thinking. And the only way you get clearer is through the practice of it. And so if I were to just recommend one thing, it would be to get a blank journal, get a pen, not a pencil, because you don't want to erase what you're thinking. Just get everything out and do that as a daily practice. Again, this is what we do in the classroom. And I promise you that it works. If you do it for a month and just try it for 30 days, and this is not prescriptive, but I, I've seen it time and time again, I've been doing it for 19 years. I see it time and time again, move the bar in the way that my students are starting the way they think and the number of ideas that they have and the fulfillment they feel about their own creative ability shifts the more they are able to do this. And I've also contrasted that with when we've stopped journaling because we've gotten into the, the nitty gritty of just trying to get our movies finished. And I see a dramatic difference in stress levels, in the experience of anxiety and chaos that the students kind of experience in their day to days when we don't have that five minutes, 10 minutes, or however long that we take in the beginning of class to journal. And whether it's with prompts or, or not, and I think there's also a distinction to make, and this is what's really uh, liberating in the practice, that this is just for you. Like I would yeah. say eventually when you have enough of a uh, momentum or even a possible desire, not everyone needs to do this, but there's a dramatic difference between writing for yourself, sketching for yourself, getting your ideas out to have a relationship with yourself. There's a dramatic difference between that and publishing for the outer world and putting that work out there. I think that eventually everyone should to some degree share their ideas, but there is a whole nother can of worms that that can open up that may even sabotage your creative drive. So I would say starting with that is the first step and practicing that and getting to a place where you feel that chaos start to it within you just start to kind of dwindle down. And then from there thinking, do I want more than this or is this actually enough? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, th I, I fully, um, I fully agree with that. Like there's, I think there's a, a really important part of it that you just mentioned there, especially is just the idea of if this, this is just for you. And I think usually when we're trying to create anything or in, in any other form of life, we always think of something almost that we can show other people. But there's this gorgeous process at the start of this, particularly with journey journaling, where you're really just getting to know yourself. Because I think we kind of take for granted that we actually do know ourselves quite well. But if we actually, if we think of that as an external relationship, if the person you were hanging around with was always on their phone when, you know, as we tip, a lot of people are when they're just by themselves, if they're online, you're rarely, you're rarely just by yourself. And so how well can you possibly know yourself if you're not spending time with yourself? If you're not, I think almost this journaling as an act of communicating with oneself as well, which I, I find has pretty profound implications, not just from the point of view of ordering your thoughts and getting to know yourself, but just also even in just dabbling with this sense of like, the satisfaction of i don't know maybe capturing a certain uh capturing things in a certain way uh, and the the satisfaction that comes with the this how the succinctness or the clarity in which you did that uh, i don't know there's some there's a really beautiful process to it all look pj all you throughout the course of the conversation i know you're saying it's starting off with this question of achieving more and being good enough and at that tension and exploring your journey through that question and and also in terms of your own journey with your new creative endeavors what happens to you when you're not creating to also then the idea of 
you know, setting out this vessel out to sea as well. At some point, we all have to, with our creative endeavors as well, perhaps, you know, step into the void. There's a beautiful practice with this, uh, a creative life at times of, of, of stepping into ambiguity, stepping into the unknown, not knowing where this is going and just be willing to, to stay with that until maybe something crystallizes. Like there's a beautiful practice in that in life as well. But then also you're talking throughout the course of this, like how you're looking to inspire, whether it's in the classroom or through your work online, inspiring other people towards creativity and, you know, trying to get people more in touch with what their own meaningful or fulfilling life is. And and so contributing to other people's life is is something that you've mentioned as well. But also this like sense that you you get from creativity, which obviously, obviously seems very important too, is just moments in life where we can be a little bit more present where we can step into flow. And, you know, you mentioned this a lovely analogy or kind of metaphor of coloring in the lines. And I also kind of saw that as like us just having the courage to be ourselves a little bit as well in life, you know, just stepping into stepping into who we are. And then in terms of just, you know, you've mentioned obviously family is very important to you. You've touched on on friends. And even sadly, when you mentioned even when a friend had passed, how that made you reflect even on our, on our use of time, but also our connection with people as well and the importance of that as well. Just as I, as I tend to ask PJ at the end of these conversations, what is a good life for you, sir? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, one of the, if I, if I go back to what creativity and its practice has allowed me to do, the most, the most fulfilling aspects have, of it has been building connections and in developing relationships with people that I would not have had the opportunity to connect with if I was staying in my own island of, of uh, just one day, one day, one day I will. And so I think there is something to be said about, you know, there's so many reasons that I've already kind of talked about, about having this creative practice. But I think if I was to say, ultimately, what that allows you to do, you know, and I touched on this when we talked about like empathy and, you know, because you're putting your work, again, going back to my initial like recommendation of, you know, you, you're building a relationship with yourself when you're journaling and sketching, doing that work for yourself and for first. If you take the next step and you publish your work, then you're taking, you're building relationship, relationships with other people. And I think a meaningful, good life is engaging in a creative practice to be able to build deeper relationships, whether that's with yourself or that's with others. And I think if I was to distill it down, ultimately that for, for me would be fulfilling. And if, in some, yeah. and, and it's also really kind of a neat side note, you know, by me creating, my kids will come around and they will watch me do it and they will grab an iPad and they will draw with me. And so yeah. it's, it just continues to compound itself because we're present in these moments versus i mean what's the alternative we distract ourselves throughout our whole lives until it's too late and whether that's through social media scroll doom scrolling or watching tv and there's nothing wrong with doing these things but everything should be deliberate and intentional and i think so if i was to add one more little piece to that is doing all of this with some level of intentionality so that we don't get into these default states to fall into these um, unintentional default states rather you could maybe get into a a routines and those routines are all have have been deliberately crafted for you and uh with all these components that we just kind of talked about in mind and that is different versus one day looking back and thinking, how did I get here and not being um, happy with that? Yeah, I think uh, I love this idea of 
art kind of building or not even art but creativity building a bridge between yourself and yourself like between you and your unknown self shall we say yeah and then how it can also then go out to the world as well and and there can be so many other connections or other kind of creative uh, buds blossoming as a count of one person expressing and the, the the effect that that has on the world as well and especially as well i really think like a a continuous engagement in this it is almost like the the antidote to a defaulted existence and not an i don't mean that in a in a uh, in a judgmental sense but i just mean if you're continuously engaging in these things like you've mentioned like a sense of ambiguity a sense of uncertainty uh, one thing i'll definitely be taking from this conversation is almost like the idea of art and distill is distilling thoughts almost like a bit of a quest mm. and that you know usually we kind of think of these things in terms of resilience as in coming through certain emotions or doing something physical but i really think even in my own experience of trying to distill thoughts or write an idea or have certain conversations there is something to that in, in that it is a degree of a, a quest and not necessarily with a fixed destination or a destination at all but just the process of evolving through it i think is a really beautiful idea as well and um, look, PJ, thank you so much for your time today. And thank you so much for joining us on the What is a Good Life podcast. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, I look forward to, to following your work in future as well. Thanks for watching the latest clip from the What is a Good Life podcast. My name is Mark McCartney. I'm the host of this podcast and I'm also a coach based in Berlin. Over the last two years, I've interviewed over 150 people around this question and I've distilled these findings, anecdotes and experiences into both corporate workshops and one-on-one -on -one coaching programs. If you're a corporate looking to book a workshop for your next event or you're a working professional in need of finding answers to some of the bigger questions in life, please direct message me below for a free 30-minute consultation.